In its latest report on key technologies that may have a profound global impact, the World Economic Forum has identified 10 technologies that will have a positive impact on society in the next three to five years. The World Economic Forum report is important and has been accurate in the past in crystal gazing into future technology. In fact, some of the leads identified have gone on to win Nobel Prizes for science. The technologies in question, the World Economic Forum says, have the power to disrupt industries, grow economies, improve lives and safeguard the planet if designed, scaled and deployed responsibly. So in a few moments from now, we'll be joined by Jeremy Yergens, the Managing Director of the World Economic Forum. But first up, a look at some of these technologies and their potential impact on billions. For starters, flexible batteries, the rapidly escalating development of wearable devices, flexible electronics and bendable displays demand that power sources match the agility of these systems. So think about it, batteries which actually bend. Now the forecasted growth of the global flexible battery market between 2022 and 2027 is $240 million. Let's talk about general artificial intelligence. Now general artificial intelligence or AI is a powerful type of generative artificial intelligence is a powerful type of AI that can create new and original content by learning patterns and data using complex algorithms and methods of learning which have been inspired by the human brain. Now, at this stage, we've all heard about chat GPT, but the future uses of this will be far, far more significant, much more profound. Sustainable aviation fuel, moving the aviation industry towards net zero carbon emissions. Designer phages, engineering viruses to augment human, animal and plant health. The end result, the treatment of serious illnesses. The metaverse for mental health, that's been identified as well. Shared virtual spaces to improve mental health. Wearable plant sensors, revolutionizing agriculture data collection to feed the world. Think about it, this is absolutely profound. If farmers in India know about the exact status of their crops and their plants, then it could have profound impact on food production. Spatial omics, that's molecular level mapping of biological processes to unlock life's mysteries. And I promise you, if you think this is all very complicated, we'll be breaking this down for you in just a few moments. Flexible neural electronics, in other words, better engineered circuits to interface with the nervous system. Sustainable computing is important for the future. What is sustainable computing? Well, designing and implementing net zero energy data centers, data centers which facilitate, for example, Google searches, email, the metaverse, AI, and a myriad of other aspects of an increasingly database society. This consumes a whopping 1% of the total electricity produced globally. So you need to have sustainable computer systems which bring down these costs substantially. AI facilitated healthcare, new technologies to improve the efficiency of healthcare systems. Well, joining us now, Jeremy Jurgens, Jeremy Jurgens, the Managing Director of the World Economic Forum. Wonderful, uh, Jeremy, to speak to you again. Before we actually talk about the technologies, could you tell us about the basis on which they've been shortlisted. Yeah, thank you for asking the question there. We actually used five criteria. You mentioned equity was one of them. We also looked at people, you know, the way that improves people's livelihoods, uh, planet or sustainability, right? Uh, the impact they can have on that in the uh, sustainability domain. And then as well, uh, prosperity, you know, how much can this actually create wealth or employment? And last, the potential to be uh, disruptive uh, within industry. So we use these five elements. Uh, arguably, equity and the importance to people's individual lives is the most important. Uh, in the forum, we talk about a human fourth industrial revolution. And, uh, you know, when we selected these technologies, that was very much at the heart of the selection process. Ultimately, there's a profound economic impact of this, right? 
uh, within the next five years, you expect some of these technologies to have a transformative impact. That's the point that we are making here. Definitely. We, we believe that all of them will have a transformative impact, both in the near term, the next five years. Uh, you know, looking beyond five years, it's actually really hard to predict, right? If you try and think of five years ago, all of the things that uh, are present today, whether technologically, economically, geopolitically, I'd have to say, you know, we wouldn't have been able to imagine it. Uh, or possibly we would have imagined it, but we couldn't have predicted that it would uh, turn out the way it is. I think as the uh, pace of technological development continues to accelerate, you know, when we talk about this exponential growth, uh, it makes it even more difficult uh, to predict further out into the future. But some of these near-term near estimates, we can already see because of investment flows, the demand, and so on, that they will have a, a substantive economic impact. Now, I think it's amazing that some of the technologies which you identified years back went on to win um, or become Nobel Prize winning science, you know, mRNA vaccines, for example. But let's talk a little bit about some of the technologies that you've now identified. Flexible batteries forecast to grow between 2022 and 2027 massively. Could you give us an idea of how flexible batteries have already started changing our lives? Great. Look, you can look at a number of different areas. Um, you know, we've seen the release of uh, recent uh, headset devices from some of the companies and say, okay, you'll need to carry your battery pack with you. Now, imagine if the battery pack was actually built into your shirt or in your uh, pants, then you actually have a power system that's uh, continually embedded within your clothes. Um, similarly, if you think in the medical sector, uh, the ability to have sensors that are powered, you know, they can actually fit the exact uh, circumstances or the need uh, in that case. And you can imagine, uh, you know, being able to uh, use uh, sensor technology in a much wider range of the use cases yeah. and for longer periods of time uh, with more ease of use of the, uh, for the end user there. Mr. Yerkins, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence and generative artificial intelligence. The world knows, for example, about ChatGPT. But the applications going forward are much more significant than that. Um, and that's what we are essentially talking about. So in the future, what is, uh, how can we actually look at generative AI? Where would it take us? Well, that's a billion dollar, if not a trillion dollar question. But as we look out uh, to generative AI, I think there's a few, you know, key elements that we have to work through. Um, you know, uh, there's a tension between whether we'll have kind of closed models uh, or we'll have open source models. Uh, you know, the debate is still out on that one. I suspect personally that we'll see a mix. We'll see both cases. Um, you know, another question comes to, you know, how large can the models get? Uh, mm -hmm. You actually have a a point of probably declining returns where we don't necessarily have a generation of new information that feed the models, uh, but will we see more specialized models, right? So we may end up having a health, you know, a model dedicated for healthcare, or a model dedicated for finance, or a model dedicated for agriculture. Um, all these domains you can imagine much more specialized models uh, in place there. And of course, there's the question of where does the data come from? Who owns that uh, data? Uh, what are the benefits there? Um, what biases does the data potentially carry with it? These are all issues that we're still in the very early stages of uh, working through. Nonetheless, um, given the uh, profound and deep kind of uh, transformative uh, potential aspects, both economically, socially, uh, and politically, uh, we'll see continued advances in this space, and I actually expect that it'll uh, continue to accelerate quite rapidly, even if we can't answer all those questions today. Designer phages, which engineer viruses to augment uh, human, animal, and plant health, that's fascinating. Essentially, we are in a position to design viruses to kill other viruses, and, and what we're talking about is technology very different from vaccines, right? This is correct. The... Uh, what we're looking at here is also in the microbiome. So there's increasing recognition that the biological system within we, which we operate isn't contained with, just within our uh, 
individual bodies or with the individual structure of a plant or tree, but actually extends out into a wider ecosystem. Uh, we're still just at the very early stages of understanding uh, how these uh, systems interact, uh, what implications they have. And uh, again, this is an area that uh, with increased tools, increased research going into these domains, uh, I expect that we'll continue to learn more and more. And if we look back, you know, just to the uh, CRISPR um, yeah. development, you know, it's just a little over a decade old, right? And sure. so that's just at the editing level. Uh, and now we move into synthetic biology, uh, which is even less than a decade old, where you actually can create synthetic structures. And now we start looking into the microbiome uh, domain. And again, so just as we say, uh, incredible advances uh, related to CRISPR, now synthetic biology. We expect this to be kind of the next frontier uh, in the biological domains. Mr. Yagans, how can the metaverse be used uh, for mental health applications? Yeah, that's a great question. We see a number of use cases where um, now some doctors are using the metaverse as part of therapy. Uh, so it actually can help people uh, experience in a different environment, they create empathy, uh, individuals that have uh, certain fears, concerns, uh, different elements. Uh, the metaverse acts as kind of an intermediator, intermediary interaction space uh, that people can um, better explore, better understand themselves, and work with the therapist for improved mental health. Plant sensors, I mean, that's, that's incredible, particularly in my country, in India, we depend so heavily on the monsoon. If farmers are able to get a clearer idea of the condition of their crops based on sensors which are actually there on the crops, you know, it could have a transformative impact in terms of food production for a billion plus. Um, when we talk about variable plant sensors, what exactly uh, is the technology? How does it work? Yeah, so I, I'm glad you mentioned this one. You know, the selection of this was definitely influenced by some of the work that we've been doing in Tilangana and other states in India. We had our AI for agricultural initiative there. Uh, I recall visiting Tilangana last year, and we were looking at the use of drones uh, there. So you can imagine, you know, all those like three layers, what happens on the ground. Then you have another layer uh, that you can observe with drones, and you even have a layer uh, where you can actually use space and satellite technologies uh, to improve agriculture. So almost like a physical stack, you know, when we talk yeah. about the technology stack here. Um, plant sensors are just one additional element to that stack, where through improved data uh, collection and monitoring, we can actually improve the application of uh, water, you know, for mm -hmm. irrigation, uh, pesticides, uh, detect, you know, invasion. So a whole number of factors that we can understand the uh, plant health, uh, the soil health, and respond to that uh, in a proactive way. And as a result, uh, increase yields, uh, reduce wastage, and improve the time to market. So all the factors that go in, this just becomes one more layer in that technology stack, and uh, a very important one. Spatial omics, I mean, I frankly, I had not known about spatial omics before I read your report. So essentially, you're talking about molecular level mapping of biological processes to unlock uh, the mysteries of life. What are the questions to say to which we seek answers? Yeah, so here with spatial omics, we start to understand that there's uh, 37 trillion cells approximately. I think in the report, we said 37.2 trillion cells. Hard to measure when you get to, to those numbers. Again, all of those cellular structures are interacting with one another, uh, responding in different ways. Uh, spatial omics actually helps us better understand the relationships among those cells uh, in the environment in which they interact. And this is a very new area. And, you know, kind of domain that wasn't possible uh, 10 years ago, right? We didn't have the compute power uh, even to monitor or model uh, any of these types of elements. So there are things that might have been able to do mathematically, but in a practical sense, you weren't able to apply it. Now we're actually with these new technologies, increased compute power, uh, improved storage, improved mm -hmm. uh, visualization, data visualization techniques, all these things coming together in spatial omics to actually allow us an improved understanding of these uh, 37 trillion cells 
and uh, you know their role in uh, human health. One final question, Mr. Jurgens: Flexible neural electronics. What is the future that uh, you know that that you have identified as being so profound? Yeah, in the near term, you know, I definitely see the emphasis is going to be actually on helping uh, improve uh, quality of life for individuals who are paralyzed, uh, lost the mobility, and for someone who's been in a situation that they're uh, unable to walk or move a certain limb of the body, uh, this is a pretty life-changing experience. We're still in the early stages, uh, but we see now with the clinical trials that have been conducted, uh, you know, really rapid progress. And again, this yeah. is something that's been enabled by improved compute power, yes. uh, improved uh, uh, sensors throughout. I don't want to look out further into the future, um, but at least in the near term, we see immediate benefits to improve uh, individuals' quality of life to uh, mitigate or adapt to you know, personal uh, health situations they may be in there. All right, Mr. Jurgens, uh, lovely speaking to you. Thank you very much uh, indeed for identifying, uh, you know, I mean, these technologies are telling us a little bit about it. The future will be transformed once this actually comes of age in many cases. Thank you very much indeed.